Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am the Omni Viewer, back for my third round with the Iron Fist series. And uh, before we get to that, the episode that is, just something I haven't mentioned the last couple times. The opening theme music, opening title sequence in general. Um, the reason I haven't actually mentioned it the first couple of times is because, honestly, it has left no impact on me. Like, if there's one thing I'd have to agree with the critics so far as to, in terms of the show not working, it would have to be with the opening titles. Because, com especially compared to the other Netflix shows that, that Marvel has done, like, Daredevil's opening, brilliant. Like, absolutely gorgeous. The music is instantly recognizable, starting with that simple metal... Seh. Sorry, simple melody that da 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 that just builds as more instruments are and melodies and stuff are added on top of it, along with the visuals with the blood pouring down to reveal previously invisible structures and objects to show Daredevil seeing the world in a different way from everyone else. That it's a great opening. Like that in itself, that's art. Jessica Jones's opening has an also really good music track to it, that more noirish, starting with a bass, dun, 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 you, you know what it is. And it, rather than build just by adding more music to it, it changes tempo, it gets more intense as you add the guitars and whatnot, and really makes you, puts you on edge, basically. And combined with the visuals of that, which deliberately look unpolished but also the perspective mainly it's all it always feels like you're watching somebody because it's always from the perspective of someone watching someone else makes you feel almost voyeuristic in a way and ending with that shot of Jessica's eye it makes you think oh so maybe this is referring to her being a detective or maybe it's referring to her paranoia how she's always watching people because she doesn't know who to trust Luke Cage's opening, step down, I will be perfectly honest. Um, the, sh the shots they use for it are okay. Shots of Harlem, which is central to the series, and that slow motion of a clearly CGI Luke Cage doing the punch that reveals the title. I mean, not thrilling per se, not the most interesting thing to look at, but gets the job done, I suppose. The music d sets itself apart from the others by having that funky 70s vibe, but unlike the other two, I don't really remember it. Like, I try to remember it and I think, wait, is that the Luke Cage opening or is it the commercial bumpers for Adult Swim? So, I, I yeah, the music didn't necessarily leave an impact, despite being distinct from the other two. And the choice to color everything gold was also good, because gold, yellow, that's kind of Luke Cage's costume color. But with Iron Fist, Iron Fist's opening just doesn't work, I'm sorry. Um, everything is either black or navy blue with only a couple sparks of yellow every so often, and it's, it's interesting to see the clearly CGI character doing all these moves, I suppose, but They've got the stuff coming off of him that I think is supposed to be wisps of smoke or represent she or something, but because everything's black and because it's so thick, it looks more like there's oil pouring off of him. And the music is even more forgettable. I, I, for as forgettable as Luke Cage's music might be or easy to confuse with other things, I. I can't tell you what the music is for this show, and I literally just watched the episode. Um, they, they didn't even do anything like add a little bit of an Eastern sound to it. Well, thinking about it, they kind of did. They, there are a couple notes that you kind of think, okay, that sounds vaguely, kind of, sort of, Eastern-ish, if you tilt your head, plug one ear, and ignore everything else around it. Otherwise, completely generic. I I hope they step it up later. I mean, throw in a sitar or a shamisen something. Come on. 
But anyway, just wanted to get that out of the way. Now on to the episode, the interestingly titled Rolling Thunder Cannon Punch, which just might be the best title in the whole of the Marvel Netflix series. So, pardon the noises upstairs if you can hear those. Yeah, so this episode, uh, we once again get some connection to the other series by bringing in Jerry Hogarth, which, in case you've forgotten, she's the lawyer from Jessica Jones. That's where she first appeared. Did she appear in the others? I think she was at least mentioned in Daredevil's second season. Yeah, because um, they were splitting off to, to join her. Yeah, she was in Daredevil's second season. But, um, yeah, she's in it. She's representing Danny Rand now as the legal troubles between him and the Meacham siblings starts to get worse. Which, yeah, that's, that's rough. I mean, seeing people who used to be childhood friends-ish, I guess, because I, I never got the impression that Ward was supposed to have been a friend, but still, it, it's not fun to see, and that's the intention. And, of course, they finally have a way to actually prove that Danny Rand is Danny Rand because of the fingerprint he left on that little dish thing. And they didn't reveal it in this episode. Pretty sure that Joy was behind that. All the implications are there. So, um, yeah, it's interesting with her character. I don't know where her loyalties lie yet, because... The first two episodes, she's been spending the whole time doing the whole I am in charge of a business, or in partly in charge of a business with my brother, and I have to think about that and my well-being, and I, have, I don't want to get sucked in emotionally if you really are crazy kind of thing. But in this episode, we start to peel back a couple layers and see something a bit more under the surface, because... She works out a deal that part of what the family's trying to do is secure the peers for some reason. We don't know yet, but if it's the same peers that have shown up in, say, Daredevil, where all those shady dealings with the Hand have gone down, then I, I can make a few guesses, certainly. But, uh, yeah... The way she gets it is basically, how do I even describe it? She basically brings the guy that they're doing the business deal with to a hospital where this kid, like teenager or early, early 20s at the oldest, is basically about to die and he's an organ donor and she tells him that he arra she arranged for his liver to go to this businessman's nephew, was it? I think it was nephew or son, some sort of relative who really needs it. And that's how she gets him to sign over the peers. And you're thinking on the one hand, I mean, of all the things you could do to get someone to, to, to give you what you want, uh, giving an organ away or, or saving someone's life is a good way to do it, but not she. It felt so underhanded, so shady, and I think it is like making sure that the liver, which could go to anyone, maybe someone else who needs it, goes straight to this person in exchange for territory. Yeah, that that felt surprisingly underhanded. Well, maybe not too surprisingly. I, she, she did drug Danny in episode one, after all. So there's definitely uh, she's a wild card. I think we're. I'm not sure where her loyalties are going to ultimately fall yet. If she's gonna stick by her brother, or if she's gonna stick by Danny, because I think she gave him that little dish thing, as I said. We will see how where she goes, and we'll see how they handle it. This could be a mess, but I'm holding out hope for now. I prefer to remain optimistic. And now, on to what else? Someone I haven't actually spoken about yet in these past couple videos is the character of Colleen Wing. 
and I feel I should correct that. Now, um, Colleen Wings, uh, again, like, we've, we're only three episodes in. There haven't been many big revelations regarding her character yet. But there's a lot of potential for her to be a really good Asian character. Because, like, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has done good with Asian characters. In fact, you don't even really care that any of the characters on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. are a particular race. They're just characters. And, you know, since stereotyping is such a big issue that people have had with this series so far, let me tell you, one stereotype you can easily fall into with Asian female characters especially is the Dragon Lady where she's the seductress with a murderous streak, or maybe another one would be she's just the completely stoic, completely emotionless, would probably be a guy if not for her anatomy kind of character. Um, yeah, those are the two major ones for Asian women, especially in Western media. I don't see her falling into either of those. She's close to that second one, because she's... But I wouldn't even really say she's emotionless. She's not trusting. She has trust issues, I think. She does not trust a single person other than herself. There's clearly something else going on there. We'll see if we get a backstory, because we haven't gotten much on the intricacies of her character yet. And I think that's by design. Don't hold me to it. I could be wrong, but I think that's by design. I think we're going to learn eventually, because that's been a pattern with the series so far. They'll reveal the backstory in very specific ways, either all at once like they did with Kingpin and Daredevil, or little by little as they did with Jessica Jones. You know the drill if you've seen these shows. So, although I'm not sure how I feel about what she did in this episode, because early in the episode, she does this little thing about how she doesn't like the illegal cage fights that happen somewhere in the city. They never say where, because she finds out one of her students or teachers, volunteers, they didn't really specify what role he plays. He was teaching a class later in the episode, whatever. That kid was in one of those matches, and she speaks out against it because, yeah, there's money to be made, but it's dishonorable, it's bad for his reputation, th things like that. There's all sorts of reasons why he shouldn't do it. But then the episode ends with her going to one of those matches, uh, getting in the ring, winning, and getting a huge wad of cash. Uh, announcing herself as the daughter of the dragon, of course. Um, and I'm not sure how I feel about that because it wasn't really given the proper context. Like, yeah, she needs the money. We've established that. But for her to compromise her morals that quickly, it didn't feel like it was properly explained. But again, we're only three episodes in at this point. They could still go somewhere with it. Like, it's very possible that will come back around to bite her. And she'll have to answer for it. Or she'll have to admit that compromises must sometimes be made. Or who knows where they could go with it. Or if they go somewhere with it. I mean, again, at this point, I don't know. But, yeah, I'm still not seeing what the big issue is. I mean, the series is not the most amazing thing Marvel has ever done, and I know that this is the internet, and the majority of people can only think in terms of amazing or garbage, but there is such a thing as just okay, and so far Iron Fist is just okay. It's not blowing me away, but it's not disgusting me. And I still don't see where all these issues are with the accusations of whitewashing and... Well, maybe I'll save my thoughts on that for the next installment. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'll do. I think I've held you for long enough. 
Uh, episode 3 still has me wanting to see more, especially since it ended on a cliffhanger. That will be... Um, I don't know how they're going to resolve that one. I know they're going to, just like when you're falling off the side of a building with nothing beneath you, how do you you know, come off of that. That's not a cliffhanger, that's a I'm already off the cliff and plummeting to my doom. We'll see. Like I said, still sticking around. And still don't know what all the complaints were about. So, that's it for now. Until such time as we meet again, this is the Omni Viewer, signing off.